Thank you for hosting us today. This is such a great community and such a great project, and what a cool space here at 12th Avenue Arts. It's really the kind of space that we need more of in Seattle. We have almost 90 homes that are affordable for working people and their families, for artists, musicians, writers, and so many more. There's office space for Capitol Hill Housing and other local nonprofits. With this amazing theater, I'm gonna do some improv here today. Um, but really, it's a place where people can experience all those things, including the arts. And we have small businesses like Rachel's Ginger Beer. Rachel, thank you for that. Um, and just steps away is reliable, safe transit. Transit is such a backbone. We have to make sure more people can live there and we use that as we need it to build a safer community. I also want to thank people like Albert Zakarenko and his family. 12th Avenue Arts has meant for them and their whole family a brighter future. He grew up in the late Soviet Union and came to Seattle in 1999. He settled on Capitol Hill, awesome place, in 2006. He and his wife are freelancers. He's a medical interpreter, his wife a fashion designer. As he said, we're the kind of people who wouldn't be able to stay on Capitol Hill if it wasn't for this organization. Their little girl was the first baby to come home from the hospital and start growing up right here. That's a hopeful story. It's what we need more of in Seattle. But we have to be honest. We don't have enough of these stories. We need more affordable housing in every part of this city, and we need it as quickly as we can get it. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, the next chapter in the story of housing in Seattle, about what Seattle's done together to help people in their communities, to help people stay, and to create more housing options. But I also want to talk about the actions we can start today for more housing in Seattle. I want to share with you some of the first steps we're going to take in the coming weeks to make unprecedented investments in housing. Our plan, I call it Seattle Housing Now. We must have a sense of urgency. We have a plan to use new tools and seize new opportunities. We will do it together, working with community-based organizations, the city council, and people from throughout this city, because that's what we need to make a difference. We have a generational opportunity before us to actually bend that arc so more people can afford to live in Seattle. As your mayor, I promise you I will do everything I can to make sure we seize that chance. First, we have to be real about the magnitude of the challenge before us. Over the last decade, we have become the fastest growing city in America. And our growth has brought amazing opportunities great jobs, new fantastic restaurants, great small businesses. Our city really is the envy of so many across the country. I hear from mayors across this country about wish they could have just some of what Seattle has. But our economy is booming. We're making generational investments in things like light rail, the waterfront, Seattle Center Arena, which will be home to the championship storm, and a new NHL team. But all this growth has put significant pressures on our city, like skyrocketing rents and homes that are just out of reach for most people. From 2010 to 2018, the average rent for apartments in Seattle increased 44%. 44%. Salaries for most workers didn't increase 44%. People can't keep up. Today, the average price of a home is over $700,000. $700,000. That's triple what the house I was first able to buy in Seattle cost after I'd been employed for many years. It is harder and harder for our low-income and middle-income neighbors to be able to live in Seattle. 
You just look at the Seattle Times this morning. A new report says that among the 100 largest American cities, Seattle ranks number three, number three for gentrification since 2000. We need to be honest about something else. The lack of affordable housing is helping fuel our homelessness crisis. Homelessness is complex and people experience it for different reasons. But we know it's a proven fact. The more households that are burdened by the cost of housing, the more homelessness increases. The harder it is to build and keep and find affordable homes, the harder it is to move people from homelessness to long-term housing. And we also know this, the rising costs and the lack of affordable housing has had a direct and disproportionate impact on our communities of color in Seattle. Families that have lived in Seattle for generations are priced out and getting pushed out. We have to be honest about the history of systemic racism. We have to be and the government policies that have helped create and continue the racial disparities we see today in every part of our society, from housing to jobs to other things, everything is affected by this. It affects who can borrow money, who can afford to own homes, who can afford to rent, where they can work. These disparities continue and we must do everything we can as a city to end them everywhere we see them. that our households of color are less likely and able to own their homes. And they're more likely to pay a huge part of their incomes towards their housing. Too many of our neighbors have been moved to Renton or Kent, other places where they have to commute further and further distances to their work. It impacts them, their families, and their employers who are trying to get people in and around the communities where their restaurants and businesses are. Ultimately, the story of housing is not about statistics. It's not about graphs. It's about people. It's about families. It's about building wealth for them, for their children, and for the future of Seattle. It's about belonging. It's about where can you call home and how do you have hope? You know, it's a story about single moms like Jana Smith. 18 years ago, Jana got the chance to move into one of the homes built by Habitat for Humanity. She came to the opening of Fort Lawton when we finally were able to sign that bill. She talked about how that home helped her overcome other obstacles in her life and gave her the stability she needed to become an oncology nurse. Today, she literally saves lives. And I can tell you personally, oncology nurses, how important they were for me when I had my cancer surgery earlier this year. Housing makes a difference. It can make all the difference for single moms, like Courtney, who works a security job to support her two children. She has to work overtime just to cover the rent. Their budget is so tight, she worries that missing just one day of work will mean it all comes apart for her. And even though she works hard and juggles things, she's doing it all she can for her kids and their future. She dreams of being a first time home buyer. She needs the opportunity for home ownership for her and for her kids. And everyone in Seattle needs her to have that opportunity. We will help you, Courtney. I want to thank Courtney for being here and for giving her story, but mostly I want her to know Seattle is with you. We are with families across Seattle and across this region. We know we need to do more. All across the city, I'm hearing these stories. From the grocery store lines, to the town halls, to business tours, to parades, I hear it everywhere. And I'm listening. What I've heard is a shared vision for the future of Seattle how we all want a place to call home. We have a vision for housing that protects against 
displacement and gentrification and makes it possible for families and communities to stay in Seattle. We have a vision for a city that houses those living unsheltered and where there's a place for middle-class housing, for our teachers, our nurses, our case managers, for our social workers and firefighters, for all the people who work in the city. We must pay them fair wages, but we also have to pay wages in a way that there's also a place for them to afford a home in Seattle. We have to be that city that city that we all love and that city we want in the future where people of different incomes and backgrounds can live on the same block, in the same building, with their kids in the same schools, and they work together for the shared hopes of their city, their state, and their country. I became mayor nearly 20 months ago. I've had four priorities for translating this vision into a better future. First, we have and will continue to build true educational and economic opportunity and access to family wage jobs. We must support our families, our workers, and our youth. Because I believe the only long-term sustainable way that we can address this crisis is through shared prosperity and actions that lift all boats. Second, we have to help residents stay in their communities, in the communities they have called home and want to continue to call home. We do that by preventing eviction, fighting displacement, and combating gentrification. And the third prong is we have to build more housing for our neighbors experiencing homelessness, for our low-income earners, and for our middle class like teachers, nurses, and construction workers. We must make housing for all. Fourth, we got to innovate and secure new tools and new resources for our city to address housing in new and smart ways. Of those priorities, we've made a lot of progress. With our Seattle Promise College tuition program, we expanded a one-year program to be two years free college for every Seattle public school graduate. Two years! <laughs> Thanks to voters, every one of those kids now has an opportunity to actually get real family wage jobs. And with our opportunity promise, we want to make sure those jobs do go to our youth, that they have a chance for our pre-apprenticeship programs and programs with not just trade unions and their work, but with every employer here in the city of Seattle. We want to make sure it becomes a gateway to opportunity, a way for them to stay in and contribute to our city. Working with Council Member Teresa Mosqueda, we delivered on a Domestic Workers Bill of Rights made real progress on fair wages and reality for workers. We have to continue to do more of that together. And listening to our students in Rainier Beach, we gave free ORCA cards to high school students, to Seattle Promise students, and to many of our Seattle Housing Authority residents. It's their city. They deserve a passport and a way and mobility to get around. And together, we made funding for our equitable development initiatives permanent so we can keep investing in our community organizations who know best how to serve their communities and keep them in place. We need to be able to do that more. And we've seen the promise delivered on some incredible projects, like the Liberty Bank building. Chris, it's an amazing. It was such an honor to be there. And Chief Seattle Club which will be a spectacular new place in the heart of our city, providing housing to the first residents of our country. And we've made aggressive investments to build more housing. Thanks to the generosity of Seattle voters who were smart enough to pass the Seattle housing levy in 2017 and 2018, working with our partners, 
We've invested over $710 million in new low-income housing and middle-income housing for the neighbors in our city. Today, there are over 1,600 affordable apartments that the city has, another 7,000 the Seattle Housing Authority has. And by 2022, we think we'll have over 5,200 more affordable homes supported by the city of Seattle because of the investments we've made together. Finally, as we've invested more to build more housing, we've also implemented better laws and policies. In March, after years of work by many people in this room, we took a step towards more affordable housing when council passed and I signed into law the mandatory housing affordability law. And in June, we delivered on a decade of work to create more livable, affordable community at Fort Lawton Army Reserve in Magnolia. A venture that started with Bernie White Bear decades ago will finally become reality. It'll, this redevelopment will add nearly 250 units of mixed income affordable housing opportunities, apartments for low income households, and opportunities for home ownership. And earlier this month, working with Councilmember O'Brien, he was able to move forward the backyard cottage and in-law apartments law, which we signed into law and will provide even more affordable housing. We then signed an executive order to make sure that more people could have the finances they needed to have that available to them. So we've done a lot. But as Chris and I were talking backstage, there's still so much to be done. We have so much catching up to do. This summer and in the coming years, we have a chance to take some new steps and make unprecedented investments in housing in Seattle with our plan, Housing Seattle Now. Put simply, for both low-income and middle-income families, we have to surge our investments and try new things. I want to talk about what this plan looks like with all of you. First, we have to protect renters. There is more we can do for renters. And while we're significantly restricted by state law on rent control, we must continue to work with good landlords but protect tenants from eviction and help keep Seattleites in their home. That's why earlier this month, working with Council Member Lisa Herbold, we were announced the next steps the city will take. She and her committee are working on updating our laws so we can take advantage of the stronger state laws in the Residential Landlord Protection Act. We will protection, we will have more laws to protect particularly uh, those who have, uh, pardon me, that's easy for you to say. We will protect those who have been victims of domestic violence and survivors to reduce the evictions that are forced upon them. We also know we gotta give renters more time to save their homes after that eviction notice is served and give them more notice when their rent is going up. To give them access to emergency relocation sooner if their apartment or house they've been living in is foreclosed or goes away. We also though need to build more housing. In the next few days, I will transmit two bills to help build more affordable housing for both our neighbors experiencing homelessness and for our working people. This first bill will make sure we can take advantage of some of the new resources to build housing for our neighbors experiencing homelessness. For two years, the city of Seattle's top priority was to create more tools and more revenues for affordable housing in Olympia and it paid off on several fronts. I really want to acknowledge the entire Seattle delegation who fought in Olympia for more housing so we could do more for housing. I really want to give some particular credit to Representative June Robinson, Speaker Frank Chop, and Senator David Frocht, who were true partners in recognizing the resources we needed and making sure we got it. So working together, we increased the funding for the state's housing trust fund. It had been depleted and let go for too many years, and they've increased it. We need more, but they made a good faith investment. 
We also finally got through legislation championed by Speaker Chop and signed by Governor Inslee. It gives cities like ours the chance to keep more of the money paid in sales tax and put it to work to build affordable housing. Instead of sending that money to Olympia, we can keep it right here and put it to work. If we act boldly, we can be the first city in Washington state to take advantage of this new tool. I, it will provide us the ability to invest more than $50 million to support and build permanent housing units for people experiencing homelessness. really have to acknowledge Councilmember Lorena Gonzalez and Councilmember Mosqueda who fought hard for this in Olympia too. And Councilmember Mosqueda will move ahead on that proposal to make sure that $50 million can be put to work as quickly as we can. We also have a second bill we want to put forward. This year we have a chance to create more homes that are also affordable for our working people and working families. Too many people earn just too much to qualify for low-income housing, but it's not nearly enough to live in Seattle. In 1998, the city created the first multifamily tax exemption program to serve middle-class people and their families. It works by giving a tax exemption to builders who set aside about 20 to 25% of the homes in their buildings as income and rent restricted units. That means we have more affordable apartments and that more Seattleites of different income can live in the same building and neighborhoods all across the city. Right now, thanks to that program, there are over 4,400 homes that have been made affordable for our low income and middle income neighbors. The program is working and it's time to renew and improve it. So today I'll be sending legislation to the city council to renew and improve this program. We are already on a path to building another 1,300 new affordable homes over the next three years. And increasing this program will help us create even more. We must take these steps, every step we can, and we'll take that step today. <laughs> another opportunity lies in Mercer Street, right in the heart of South Lake Union. That's where you'll find a city-owned property, sometimes called the Mega Block, that we have been determined as a city has been underused and underutilized. It's time to put it to work. It can be put to work to create jobs and to allow us to invest in more housing all across the city. It's a generational opportunity that can help build today and into the future. We have a chance to make truly transformational investments. This is an asset owned by the people of the city, and it must provide for the future of the city. In the coming weeks, I will be announcing a detailed plan for how we can use the sale of this city property to do four things. First, create affordable and mixed income housing right there in South Lake Union so people with family wage jobs can live in that part of the city. Second, create a new program where the city can strategically buy property and then create more opportunities, like Othello Square, in locations that are facing extreme displacement and gentrification pressures. We know that transit is coming soon to places or exist. We need to use the land around those areas to build housing for the people who otherwise couldn't afford to live in Seattle. And what's happening in Othello is truly visionary. If you have not been there, go and see what the plans are. It will have both business opportunities, com affordable commercial space, home ownership, housing. It is the model of what we need to do more of in Seattle. We don't want to be 20 years from now looking back, wishing that we had invested in equitable development near transit. We need to make those investments today.
Third, I will also propose using some of this revenue from the sale of Mercer Street to create a new fund that gives low interest loans to people who want to build a backyard cottage or an in-law apartment on their property so we can get more affordable housing for everyone in Seattle. We cannot make those backyard cottages just a tool for wealthy residents or something only they can build, buy, or rent. We have to make it accessible to more. And fourth, the city should use some of the revenues to invest in affordable ownership opportunities. We know it works. You can keep clapping. We know that those communities where people have had the highest rate of displacement and gentrification, allowing home ownership is a must, and we have to do more of it. Finally, I want to say this. I know that with all of this, we need to do more. We have to keep looking for every tool to build housing near transit in every part <clears throat> of our region. We need to do more, particularly for those working families who earn $15 to $25 an hour. They can't afford to live in Seattle. And we need to make sure that as we fill the gaps, we're using every opportunity we have to build transit-oriented development that serves our communities today and into the future. In the coming weeks, I'll be announcing more ideas on how we can build that kind of housing and making sure that working families can stay and work in Seattle and to make sure that we continue the fight for fair worker wages and benefits. We also have to provide more in tenant protections. We need more low income housing. We need more middle class housing. And as I said, more housing in and around transit. It's the future we need for all of our climate goals and for the communities that we want to be building. But like any big regional challenge, we know Seattle can't do it alone. We need our partners in Olympia and the federal government to make all of this a reality. Just as we had some victories last legislative session, we need everyone to keep advocating. We will be back in Olympia for more state investments in our region and more tools for the city of Seattle. We need housing, particularly for people who have a range of behavioral health issues that are the hardest to house but need it the most. We need more money for treatment and services for mental health and substance use disorder. And we're fortunate. We have great partners, both in our state delegation in Olympia and our United States Senators, Patty Murray and Maria Cantwell, who continue to work at the national level to provide things like the low income tax credit and those tools that make this housing a reality. But we also know government can't go it alone and only does a small part of this. Our community-based organizations, our large employers, they all know that we need to step up to create a city where people who work in Seattle can actually afford to live in Seattle. We will continue to work with our philanthropists, our employers, and all across this region to see how we can provide a more equitable, a more just, a more welcoming city. To move ahead with this plan, we also will be working with the city council, who many of them have been advocates for these pro th programs for decades. I look forward to working with council members and building on this vision of housing for Seattle. President Harrell and council member Bagshaw have served us well. They're on their way out. Mike O'Brien too, we've been talking about this. Let's have our crowning months be ones where we open more doors for more people. We can build a more affordable, a more equitable, and a more just city. We can make housing Seattle now a reality. Let's seize this generational opportunity. Let's make the most of this chance. Let's work together to change the arc of housing in Seattle. Thank you for all that you do every day to make this a reality. Thanks to you and your members and your communities, because that's what makes Seattle great. Thanks for all you've done. I look forward to working with all of you.